We're going to move on to the final section of our GADP conference today, which is our organisation updates. This is a section that we have brought into our conference every year for the last three years, I think. And it's an opportunity for organisations that are all working internationally for the same cause, health system strengthening, international partnerships, and often to develop global surgery and global anaesthesia all to come together and to tell us what their priorities for the year going forward is. So everybody is going to give us a very brief overview of what they've been working on and what they're going to work on in the year to come. I will start with the Royal College of Anesthetists, in which Maria Burke is going to start telling us. Hi Sonia, thank you very much and um, thank you for having us. It's been um, a delight to be here today and to hear all about what everybody's been up to. Um, well, thank you. Um, from the Royal College side, it's, as always, been a very busy year. Um, there's been a couple of sort of larger projects that we started getting involved in. Um, you'll all be very familiar with Kineska. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but the, the college continues to engage um, with the developments on that side. Um, more recently, we've received an approach from FECT, who you, I think you'll be hearing from next, um, about um, development of anaesthetic curricula in Ghana. Um, we've had quite a few conversations with our colleagues um, from Ghana and have made some really good progress um, with Sonia as our chair, actually. So thank you very much, Sonia, um, for your help there as well. Um, we've also um, been speaking to colleagues in Uganda um, who are interested in improving their critical care um, infrastructure and training. Um, so the college um, hasn't had a huge input in at the moment, but it's likely that in a couple of years, the medical training initiative is likely to come into its own. And um, so we've been engaging in discussions there. Um, as ever, we have our MTI scheme, which continues to run and continues to go from strength to strength. Um, despite the COVID pandemic, um, we haven't really seen a big dip um, in interested parties. Although obviously in the peaks, um, we made the decision to kind of halt um, recruitment at that time. So that's been fantastic. Um, more from the college side, we've had um, in the past year, we've launched a new international member category, um, which is open to anaesthetists outside of the UK, um, which was something that wasn't previously available, but there is an avenue now, um, if you're interested in educational content um, from the college, um, I can send around details to anyone who's interested. Um, we've also received an approach from an organization called RefuAid, um, which helps to um, allow refugee do doctors or refugees from other um, professions also um, to settle in the UK and once they've been given their leave to remain by the UK government. Um, and we've been told that actually what these individuals really need is um, once they've passed CLAB and all the kind of um, bits and pieces like that, they just need somebody to talk to an anaesthetist in the UK to talk to to understand um, how the system works and how to go about um, sort of getting a job within the NHS and kind of more pastoral support. Um, so if there is anybody in the UK who might be interested, um, we are currently advertising um, for refugee buddies. Um, there's going to be a lot of work in the background to that also. So there's lots and lots of opportunities. So do get in touch with me if any of that is of interest. Um, and finally, from me, a very shameless plug, um, because the Royal College is also running a global anesthesia event, uh, which is happening on the 22nd of March. And uh, it would be lovely um, to have some of you who are online here to attend um, that event also. Um, it's going to be virtual, as is this one. And um, we've also managed to um, convince our finance department to allow people who are from low middle income countries to attend for free. Um, so if you're interested, do drop us an email at global.rcua.ac.uk and we'll get you booked on. And that's it from me. That's really helpful. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, moving on, we will then we will be hearing from um, B next, who is from FET. Thanks very much, Sonia, and, and thanks so much for having having that speak at, at um, the conference today. So, just an update from FET's side. So, um, as I as I think all of you will have experienced, FET has had quite a difficult year in in terms of the funding environment. So, we've seen kind of an increasingly hostile uh, funding environment from the UK government in terms of health partnership work and, and for international work 
um, in general, which is a shame, and I know will have affected many of you as well. So. Um, the UK Partnerships for Health Systems programme, which was an FCDO funded programme, which was um, launched last year, was unfortunately cancelled um, in spring last year, which was a, a loss of £30 million pounds of funding for the health partnership community, which was quite devastating, really. Um, but we kind of um, rallied around and, and after hearing of that cancellation, we spent a, a number of months kind of scrambling around for additional sources of funding. Um, and through that, we were able to secure some funding from the UK Department of Health and Social Care to support some work in Ghana, Somaliland and um, Uganda. Some of that was just grants management work. So we funded a number of um, projects that would have been funded through the UK PHS. And among them is um, a project being delivered by the Royal College of Surgeons of England, helping it to um, develop the ENSOAP in Somaliland, which is very exciting work. Um, we've also carried out a significant amount of work in Ghana, as Maria mentioned a minute ago. A lot of that is looking at HRH um, management, leadership and planning. Um, and we're doing that work with the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, but we're also working with a number of the Royal Colleges as I've just lost B. Is has anybody else as well? So can oh yes. anybody else? Yes. The other colleges. Sorry, can you can you hear me again? I just lost the last minute. It might have only been me. If you don't mind repeating that last minute, that would be great. Uh yeah, sure. Um so yeah, we're working in Ghana with a number of a number of the Royal Colleges, as, as Maria mentioned earlier, um, and they are supporting the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons to update their training curricula. Um, and they're also doing a, a bit of faculty development as well. So we're hoping to continue that work um, in the coming year. It's, a, it's something that we're, we're exploring with the Department of Health, but if, if funding's not available through them, we'll, we'll look to other donors as well. So that's quite exciting. Um, so it's a year, a year this week since the coup in Myanmar. Um, so that's been working a lot with the health partnership community there to continue supporting um, health workers working in Myanmar. Um, we've done a lot of advocacy and awareness raising, and we have a FCDO funded um, program called the Myanmar Emergency Fund, which supports a number of partnerships um, to help support health workers through telemedicine. Um, and there's a platform for nurses to access training as well. Um, and we're hoping to, again, continue that work for the next year. Um, in terms of our Africa Grants programme, which is our main programme focusing on surgery and anaesthesia. So unfortunately, that's coming to an end in the next couple of months. So originally, um, this is a Johnson Johnson funded work. Um, it was for four kind of rounds of funding. We have now had those four rounds and um, we're just working with them now to, to kind of think through um, what future support they could offer to us and health partnerships. Um, but they seem to be quite keen on um, continuing to support obstetric work in Somaliland. Um, we've done quite a lot of work on um, kind of the virtual agenda. So um, the COVID pandemic um, and the climate crisis as well have kind of made us rethink the health partnership model slightly. Um, so um, while it, it's true that a lot of the capacity development which is done through health partnership work does need to take place in person, we've discovered over the last few years that a lot of it can be done virtually. Um, and we have received some support from Health Education England in, in delivering a programme around virtual volunteering. Um, and that's something that we're hoping to continue again for the coming year. Um, we're also pushing forward our digital agenda, trying to connect up um, health workers across the globe. So we have a new platform called Pulse, which is helping us to do that. Um, if anyone who hasn't hasn't signed up to that yet, I would um, strongly advise you to. It's uh, an interesting forum and way of connecting with with um, colleagues overseas. Um, and we're also pushing forward our green agenda. So we will be. Um, we're, we're kind of becoming a lot more aware of our own carbon footprint. So um, we'll be carrying out an audit of our work and then putting in place a green strategy to help target those areas of, of weakness that we identify through that, that audit. Um, we've got a large amount of nursing work going on at the moment, um, particularly around nurse, increasing nurse leadership 
um, in various LMICs through mentoring schemes and, and talent groups. Um, we are also continuing our antimicrobial stewardship work uh, with the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association, and that's funded through the Department of Health Fleming Fund. So we've expanded um, and we're now working in eight countries with um, projects focusing on educating around um, antimicrobial resistance, IPC interventions, and then contributing to wider um, country antimicrobial stewardship plans. Um, and we're hoping to um, start another programme later in the year around that. Um, and then finally, we have been focusing quite a lot on well-being. Um, so we've just wrapped up an inquiry into um, global health worker well-being, um, and that should be published, I think, in the, in the next week or so. And we are continuing to engage with the health sector around how we can ensure that health workers are protected in terms of their well-being. So um, we felt that the pandemic really shone a light on some of the strains and pressures that health workers are, are facing on a day-to-day -day basis um, and that wanted to play a role in, in kind of continuing to shine that light and advocating for, um, for workplaces to, to support their health workers. That's it for me. Thanks very much. That's really helpful, B, um, and really useful to hear all of the areas that FET are working on at the moment. Um, there's just so much, which is fantastic. Um, our next speaker is from Lifebox. I'd like to introduce Senait Bitau, who's going to tell us about the work of Lifebox. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me clearly. Yes. Perfect. Uh, thank you, uh, Sonia. My name is Sanait. Um, I am the head of uh, uh, South and East Africa uh, for Lifebox uh, programs that are happening in the region. And I'll just briefly tell you about what we have been achieved the past year and uh, a little bit brief on what we are planning uh, in the next year as well. As you know, we have been working globally and uh, around the world in our last report we have impacted around 116 countries uh, through the distribution of more than 30,000 uh, pulse oximeters. And last year alone for uh, COVID response, around 6,500 uh, pulse oximeters for uh, COVID-19 patient uh, management. And also we have trained more than 10,000 healthcare providers through our different um, uh, tools and training materials we have developed and uh, we have used including the COVID-19 patient safety checklist that we have developed with WAFSA, Smile Train, and Jopaigo. And also the WHO surgical safety checklist uh, we have been using since uh, we've started, uh, we have founded Lifebox uh, uh, through the different partnership that we have globally and regionally, uh, effectively for the past year with COSEXA as well. And also the pulse oximeter uh, training also is um, coupled with uh, the distribution. And we had a one year uh, surgical uh, teamwork fellowship program that we had uh, piloted in Ethiopia and had three courts. We have trained uh, professionals from anesthesia, uh, nursing and surgical background. And also uh, we believed we, we made surgery safer for more than 30 million patients in, in, through these different approach of the, the distribution of uh, the device and trainings that we have conducted and the projects that we have implemented in Ethiopia and uh, beyond. And also uh, we have joined our forces to, uh, uh, together with SmileTrain uh, to launch a SmileTrain and Lifebox uh, Safe Surgery and Anesthesia initi Initiative, uh, which is uh, a multi-year strategic partnership to elevate the quality and safety of cleft and pediatric surgery in more than 70 countries. And this will be through capacity building, innovation and research in more than 1000 hospitals around the world. And with this partnership, uh, we believe uh, we'll be piloting, we started piloting a clean cut for cleft uh, surgery project in Ethiopia in two sites, and we'll be developing pulse oximeter together and uh, capnograph as well. Also uh, last year we have, uh, uh, actually in 2020, but uh, we have, we have uh, reported this last year, we have published uh, in the British Journal of Surgery, uh, our result of uh, ClinCat project, which is a surgical site infection reduction program, uh, which showed uh, more than 35% uh, SSI reduction 
And we're taking this, uh, scaling it in, in Ethiopia, more sites in Liberia, Madagascar, in, and in India, and beyond that in some other East African countries in this year. And also uh, we have adopted, as I said earlier, this clean cut project into the cleft surgery and uh, C-section, the C-section that we have uh, funded uh, from Mill and, uh, Mill and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, the, through the, the Grand Challenge Initiative and funded by UBS Optimus Foundation. Just to say a little about coming year, uh, specifically the coming one year from our, our fiscal year is uh, from April and we have planned uh, a lot of uh, countries, new countries to be involved with, including Zambia one as a Southern Africa country. And we'll be having um, partnership with Canexa. Uh, so I'm, I'm really glad to meet, to see, uh, I, I would not say meet, but to see most of the anesthesiologists here uh, from uh, the Canexa as well. And um, we'll be uh, including uh, Rwanda as, as a new site uh, to cascade our projects and, and many more countries in the Eastern and Southern Africa. So uh, to get, more of what we have been working on in the report, uh, the strategic plan, please go through our website, uh, lifebox.org, and you will, you will learn a lot. And thank you so much, Sonia. Back to you. Thank you, Senai. That was so useful and really impressive to see so much training capacity building, particularly with the pulse oximeters. Um, the next person we have to speak is Lyndon Baxter, who's going to tell us about the work of the International Relations Committee of the Association of Anaesthetists. Thank you very much, Sonia, and good afternoon, everyone. My name's Lyndon, and I'm uh, an anaesthetic trainee in the UK. I'm currently the International Fellow for the Association of Anaesthetists International Relations Committee. So for any of you who are not familiar, uh, the Association of Anaesthetists funds a, a range of projects and activities to support quality anaesthesia, critical care and pain management around the world through the exchange of skills and knowledge. Uh, and the International Relations Committee meets quarterly and reports to the trustee board of the Charitable Foundation. And there are a variety of grants which are very relevant to many of the topics and the work that's been discussed today. Um, so if you want to investigate any of these after this conference, you can find the information at anaesthetists.org. Um, but the grants that are available include uh, for travel, uh, as well as grants for projects, research projects, or uh, quality improvement capacity building projects, uh, as well as funding for volunteers and specifically as well for out of program training for education, such as the out of program UTs taken often by uh, UK trainees who are joining the sort of GADP fellowships we've heard about today. So you can find those various grants and bursaries um, in the section of the association website marked Get Involved, and it will also list the criteria for each different type of grant. And those uh, meetings sit quarterly, as I say, and there's a schedule for when funding is awarded. Uh, but there is also other areas that the IRC work in. We've heard um, today about the importance of coordinating and collaborating to avoid duplicating our efforts and make sure we're using resources efficiently uh, as well as providing appropriate support and coordination. So that's one great benefit of the International Relations Committee is that it brings together funding partners with various speciality interests. So alongside the Association of Anaesthetists, there are also representatives from the Difficult Airway Society, the Royal College of Anaesthetists, the World Anesthesia Society, uh, the Pediatric Critical Care Society, uh, Society for Intravenous Anesthesia, Regional Anesthesia UK, and representatives from the World Federation Society of Anesthetists. Um, so it is a very good place to apply for projects that you think any of those groups may be interested in supporting with funding or other resources. There's also a book library that has both physical and hopefully increasingly e-books that are available to apply for a donation. I'll put the link for that in the chat shortly. Um, and those can be, as I said, either the physical books in the store or uh, for ebook access. And uh, on the theme of advocacy from today, one of the key long term strategy priorities of the association is to develop advocacy and campaigns uh, alongside policy work. We've heard a lot about the importance of influencing policy to make these changes we want to see. 
So this might include communications, um, engaging in public affairs and public relations, as well as media communications to help raise the profile of, of issues that are important to our members. So again, if you feel that there's something that you'd like the um, advocacy group to engage with, you can get in touch on the anaesthetists.org website. There's a section specifically for advocacy and campaigns. And finally, the largest, um, one of the largest areas of activity from the IRC is the SAFE courses, which form a core part of the work of the IRC. And I'm sure many of you will have heard about SAFE Pediatrics, SAFE Obstetrics, but I shall leave that to Jolene Moore to tell you all about shortly. Uh, thank you very much. I will put the link for the book library into the chat. Back to you, Sonia. Thank you, Lyndon. That's really useful. Next, we have Rima Patel, who's going to tell us about the work of GASOC. Hi, Sonia. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a wonderful day so far. So congratulations. Um, so GASOC is a trainee organisation. It's composed of uh, trainees in surgery, obs and gynae and anaesthesia. So very much multidisciplinary. And the point of it is basically to encourage engaging in global surgery from a trainee level. So that ranges from foundation trainees, medical students, but also sub, sub consultant grades. Um, over the last few years, I think the organization has really expanded uh, in terms of the work that we've done. So we continue to hold bi-monthly journal clubs. Um, we've noticed over the last year, we've had increasing participation from those in low resource settings. Um, in December, we held a journal club with EADP and ZADP, which I think was really well received and really well organized as well. Um, we also held a semi sort of journal club on vaccine equity um, earlier last year. Again, really well received. Um, we've been involved in various publications. So we were invited to publish in the British Journal of Surgery on um, female genital mutilation in low resource settings. So that's just been submitted and it was really, really well written with some colleagues working in those areas. We've had held some webinars. So with the Association of Anaesthetists, we talked about ethics and global anaesthesia, and that was in May 2021. Um, we've also sort of branched out in terms of our teaching. So we were approached by a, a paediatric surgeon in Leeds um, and we essentially helped him um, deliver paediatric teaching sessions to various countries in Africa. There were three sessions attended by over 150 people um, internationally. And I think it's been so successful that he's also working with our international representative in Burundi to hold further paediatric teaching sessions. Um, we had our conference, uh, Journey of Global Surgery, Past, Present and Future. It was attended by over 150 people from over 35 different countries. Uh, really great feedback. We had the lovely Sonia here uh, speak along with Arthur and um, Michelle White as well. Um, we were lucky enough to meet up with uh, Dr. Keith Thompson, who's worked quite extensively in Africa and with Mercy Ships, and he's kindly donated some money to GASOC, um, or to use GASOC as a vessel so that we can give out travel grants to trainee surgeons, anaesthetists, and ONG uh, trainees to actually support them going out to various countries um, with travel expenses. And then we have ongoing collaboration with COSESCA and the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland. Um, so we're looking at the surgical workforce in um, Africa with them. And then in terms of our plans for 2022, um, our research and advocacy rep is really keen on organizing um, research partnerships. So one of the common themes that has been ad addressed today and we've picked up on in during our journal clubs is the desire for trainees in low resource settings to get involved in research and um, so the idea would be GASOC would be an organization that would link trainees in low resource settings and then trainees in high income settings to collaborate on research projects in its very early stages but um, hopefully that will come into fruition in the next year or so and um, we're also looking at regional events so something that GASOC is quite passionate about is um, allowing trainees to take time out of program um, or out of program experiences to engage in global surgical projects. And there is significant regional variation. Um, and interestingly, we've, 
because we have access to the curriculum for different surgical specialties and anaesthetic and ONG specialties, you can see that there are cer certain specialties that actually have global surgery within their curriculum and then other specialties that don't. So something else that we're hoping to look into this year is incorporating global surgical competencies within the surgical uh, curriculum throughout. Um, and then finally, we've got um, innovation and technology representative who will be looking at a global surgery sort of boot camp in collaboration with the Association of Surgeons in Training and hopefully like Lifebox. Um, so lots going on. Hopefully we can stay in touch and see you all soon. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Rima. Um, next, we have Jolene Moore, who is going to talk to us about SAFE. Uh, thanks, Sonia, and uh, thanks for inviting me to give an update on the SAFE activities over the past year. So Lyndon mentioned the courses, and hopefully many of you are familiar with or have at least heard of uh, SAFE for Anesthesia from Education programme, which is an initiative of the Association of Anesthetists and the WFSA. And the well-established training courses that we have include SAFE Obstetrics, SAFE Pediatrics and SAFE Operating Room. And like many others, we suffered a lot of cancellations of face-to-face -face training over the last couple of years. We have been fortunate that we've been able to continue course delivery and project activities, um, largely uh, due to our in-country partners and trainers. So we have held um, courses in Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia and South Africa over the last six months or so. And we've also been working really hard on developing and delivering online versions of the courses. Along with the SAFE faculty and in-country partners, we've delivered live online SAFE courses in a number of countries. So this has included India, Cambodia, Japan and Indonesia. And we've also had some workshops. Um, this has included the West African College of Surgeons annual congress and also at the World Congress held last summer. The UK Training of Trainers course, we were also able to deliver um, online and the Safe Pediatrics Great Britain and Ireland course, which is the UK version of Safe Pediatrics, has now been translated to Japanese and delivered virtually. And there's also plans for face-to-face -face delivery of that fairly soon. And we've also developed and launched the Safe Online Learning Platform uh, with the full Safe Online Obstetrics e-learning based course available. And the pediatrics version is uh, currently under development and hopefully will launch in the not too distant future as well. Um, we've had a module from the Safe Obstetrics Online course being piloted in Uganda, and we're soon to run a full hybrid course uh, throughout Liberia. We've also developed new SAFE courses and programmes. So we've had a one day SAFE obstetrics refresher course, which we've been running in Tanzania and also on site SAFE mentoring at hospitals throughout the Mbea region of Tanzania as well. Um, we've had a multidisciplinary SAFE cesarean section course trialled in Kenya with plans for further development and rollout of that in neighbouring countries. And um, we also have a SAFE cleft course, which is very nearing completion and ready for, for pilot. We also had our 10 year celebration event in December. So this um, allowed us to celebrate 10 years of safe courses. And during uh, the last 10 years, we've held over 320 courses, training more than 5,800 participants and more than 1,400 trainers. So this enabled us to, to celebrate um, all that we've managed to achieve. And we've now reopened our safe grants uh, with plans for a number of face-to-face -face courses in the coming few months including some which have previously been cancelled, as well as a number of new plans. We do continue to work with well-established partners for these, and we've also been able to sign agreements with new partners for delivery of a number of, of courses across different regions over the next 18 months. So in the coming year, we're going to be focused on re-establishing our face-to-face -face training, uh, hopefully to previous levels and beyond, and we'll continue to develop and pilot our new courses and newer methods of safe delivery. Thank you very much, Jolene. Again, just truly incredible how much has been achieved during a pandemic and how much will be achieved going forward. If anybody has any questions for any of the people you've heard speak, either post them in the chat or you're welcome to get in touch with us afterwards and we'll forward your emails on. Um, the last organisation is the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists, who I'm going to speak about. The WFSA is a society of societies, and what it does is it works with professional anesthesia societies of countries all over the world to help develop safe anesthesia. 
what a large part of the work that it does is through its individual committees, of which one committee is the Education Committee, and I'm going to focus the update for this year on the work of the Education Committee. First of all, the Education Committee is just starting a very new, very large project looking at developing an online community of practice for anaesthesia providers all over the world, taking into consideration, hopefully, the individual educational and professional needs of so many cadres in so many countries globally. This is going to be done, this is going to form part a, lar a large part of the WFSA strategy in the years to come. So hopefully we will see a lot more about this. But the work at the moment is being done to assess what this could look like, where the needs are, and how we can develop this into our strategy. This is being done through lots of different work streams. The largest that's happening at the moment is a very big research project, which is part of a needs assessment to see what um, currently anesthesia providers have access to and what they would like access to, both in terms of education, learning, but also collaboration, mentorship, sharing, and any other professional needs. And this is happening alongside different groups and different work streams researching the platforms and other technology based support that is already available either in research or is actually being actively used at the moment. So that's a large piece of work that we're going to be seeing um, a lot of outputs for over the next six to 12 months and seeing how that really gets embedded into WFSA strategy in the years to come. The other two things that the WFSA Education Committee are working on at the moment is our update in anaesthesia, special education, medical education edition. Update in anaesthesia is an open access journal, which is the journal of the WFSA. And we've never had a special medical education edition before. So we're really, really proud of this. And it should be released to everybody who's a member, or you can also access it through our website. Um, in the weeks to come. We've got a number of papers which have been written by anaesthetists and teachers from all around the world and have been supported by a whole host of reviewers from both low, middle and high income settings. And the idea is that this edition will have both important up to important teaching concerning medical education, incorporating a lot of important things from what we know from research and practice, but also some practical tips about how you can use what is in this journal to help develop your education practice. And the final thing that I was going to mention is the fellowships. A lot of the WFSA work is through providing specialty, subspecialty training fellowships for anesthesia providers throughout the, um, throughout the world. And these, as you can imagine, have been very affected by COVID-19 and the need for many people who were undertaking fellowships to be able to return home to their families and their home countries. But these are growing again. We currently have the Pediatric Fellowship in Nairobi running and a Pediatric and Pain Fellowship in Bangkok running. And there are a lot of plans and a lot of work going into re-establishing our past subspecialty fellowships in 2022 and seeing how these can continue to support anaesthesia development. So that's it for the WFSA update. And that's it also from our organisations update today. Thank you so much to all of the organisations who have taken their time to um, come and talk to us today and update each other. You can see from just what has been presented in this very short session today that each organisation is doing an absolutely huge amount of work. And it's interesting and important to share our work, our achievements, and to be able to know who to go to and who we can collaborate with next. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and share all of the work that you've been doing in this forum today.